Romans chapter 11 is quite a complex chapter because this part, it has some of the information whose understanding we shall get in heaven. But there's enough for us to understand to live our life now. He is talking about sovereignty. That's the orders. He's also talking about his decision to do whatever he chooses and doesn't have to give an explanation. He's also saying that the Jews, he will turn back to them after a certain number of Gentiles have come to know him. Again, very complex in thinking about it. Just, just see what he's saying in verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. You understand what God is saying? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. But Roma, Romans, which is written by Paul, clearly says what God is telling us is a mystery. Even for it to be called a mystery, even Paul himself does not he, had, he knows what the mystery is. Understanding the mystery? You just have to leave it to God. And I think that's one of the problems we have with many cults. Even what is left to be understood in heaven. They try to explain it. For example, they try to say that Trinity is not, it's not a mystery. And they try to explain that God is only Jesus. Now, when you look at the scriptures and you can see God the Father is there, God the Son is there, God the Holy Spirit is there, and yet the same scripture are telling you, you, can, you don't have three gods. You have only one God. Express in three persons. You try to explain it one way, like you explain that to, that that it's like uh, the way water can be solid, liquid, or, or air. But unfortunately, this is not true because if water becomes a solid, all the water becomes solid. If water becomes liquid, all of it becomes liquid. When water becomes air, all of it becomes air. But here, the three are concurrently alive. And that's why we call it the mystery of Trinity. And I think Paul in Romans chapter 10 wants us to understand, despite all that God has revealed, he still wants us to know certain things remain a mystery. And we shall not understand them, but there is enough to understand for us to walk with the Lord and leave the balance in his hands. It's like we are teaching... A class, two, a, a class two child, and then they want to ask questions that are only understood in the university. It's not that you don't know the answer, but you don't give them the answer yet because you know it will just confuse them. So you only give what is relevant for that age. Similarly, God knows exactly what, is, um, what we can understand, what we can handle, and that's what is written in the scriptures, both New and Old Testament. At the level we can understand it. Then he introduces a subject which we have to look forward to getting to know in heaven. Because we actually can't answer it. What are the mysteries that the Bible has not explained? But the devil wants to use in order to mislead you. You get a couch here that says, ah, it's easy, I can do it, I can explain. And then you follow that couch. Yet the scriptures have not changed. The mystery is still in the scriptures. You know, to be a Christian means to accept the Lord as Jehovah, as sovereign, as deciding what you should know and what you should not know. And what you don't know, you don't go and get to know. So when you say you are on the mountain and you saw a revelation and you saw things in the mountain, you come down and you begin your own church with strange teachings, my friend, the canon was closed. What does that mean? The Bible is not increased. Anything after the book of Revelation, if you read anything, 
it must be compared what is what is in the book of Revelation. And if it's not consistent with what is available, you know that's not the Spirit of God. Because Jesus said, what he, the Spirit will not teach new things. He will teach you what I have told him to teach you. So therefore, there's nothing you can say you interacted with the Holy Spirit and he told you something that's not in the Scriptures. Mm -mm. Making it, trying to demystify a mystery that the Lord left as a mystery. My friend, you end up lost completely. You know, there's somebody who wanted to say that um, that 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 um, that there is a he has come special as the last prophet, and um, because he's the last prophet, he has a special message, and he started saying things that uh, you can't see in the Bible, but he's saying them, and so he began, and because God had used him in a big way, doing all kinds of miracles, when he started now veering to this new teaching, a number of people followed him. And he started telling us, I was then in the university in the 1970s, telling us that Jesus Christ is coming back in 1977. Yet the Bible had told us there is nobody who can know the date or the hour when Jesus is coming. But this man who was involved in a lot of miraculous work and a lot of teaching worldwide, a worldwide ministry, says he could tell us it will be 1977. A number of my friends even got married, at least to test marriage before, <laughs> before, before, before Jesus comes, since we are there, the Bible tells us there will be no marriage in heaven. My friend, 1977 came and left, and Jesus never came. Because they trying to make a mystery less than a mystery, you end up in trouble. You give yourself over to the devil very easily for him to destroy you. So, look at verse 25 again. For I do not desire, brethren, today, yesterday, tomorrow, brethren. Those are people who are like him, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. In other words, don't hide. Let the word of God be taught in its entirety. But what is not explained, don't try to explain. I don't want to begin on, I'll tell you the mystery, but it'll still be a mystery. What a mystery? Mm. And it's not just, um, just a small matter. He goes on to say, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. In other words, before we come to the mystery, the danger of not getting to understand a mystery is a mystery is you become wise in your own opinion. In other words, you have an opinion, but you start giving it as a fact. You start giving it like it's a reality of life. And yet it's just an opinion you have about an issue. Please accept what, there's, it's impossible not to have opinions on certain things. But please admit something is an opinion when it's an opinion. If when something is a fact, there will be evidence that's a fact. When it's an opinion, give it an opinion. But don't be wise. Paul is calling it, don't be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. In other words, this idea of starting to be to insist on your own opinion, Jesus is not real, he is not God. That's what they caught the Israelites. And they were they now can't see how Jesus could be the Messiah. They were blinded. Paul is saying that blinding will not be forever. The blinding, and that's where the mystery is. That this idea of the Jews not being blind and rejecting Christ for, forever is not, going to, is not going to be forever. That's a mystery. Because he is saying, according to this mystery, one, the full number of Gentiles has become Christians. Then you see a revival, latter-day revival of Jews Accepting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And verse 26 is saying, and so all Israel will be saved. Wow. So finally, Israel will be saved according to what the word of God is actually saying. So God has a number that he is waiting for to accept him out of the Gentile world. Once the number is reached, 
then it will be time for him to turn his attention to his old people, the Jews. What does that tell you? <laughs> that the original intention was God to use the Israelites, but now they were blinded, so we have gotten a chance. Shouldn't you as a Gentile become very grateful to the Lord that you now can pray to Jehovah, you know Jehovah, he has done miracles for you, he is walking with you, he has comforted you, and all that was not available to you if it were not for the blindness that the Jews had. So, you can then understand the message of verse 26, that I'm only quoting, Paul is telling us, I'm quoting the scriptures. The devourer will come out of Zion. That's, that's the one who will deliver us fully. So we are Jew. And he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. His attention, once his attention is turned to Israel, they will not be ungodly anymore. Uh, for this is my covenant with them, the Israelites, when I take away their sins. That's something God is saying and we should uh, be aware of. God has promised a turning back, a revival of the Jews where he will bring them an offer of forgiveness. And um, the reason you do that is not because they are good people. No, no, no. That's still part of the mystery. It is simply because he has chosen them. They are not good people, but he has chosen them. So he will turn his attention to them. And I think then verse 28 is saying, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. In other words, they don't want to hear the gospel. The idea of Jesus Christ? Mm -mm. They don't believe Jesus is a Messiah. They are actually enemies and they have they hurt Paul many times. He was beaten until he was left for dead by Jews and the people he had, they had mobilized. Why? Because they hated the gospel. They are enemies of the gospel. Concerning the gospel, these Jews are enemies. But they are enemies for your own sake. Because as long as they keep rejecting the gospel, it's opportunity for the gospel to be preached all over the world. But concerning the election, the choosing of God in his foreknowledge, election is the theological word they give it, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. In other words, God has elected the Jews for the sake of, the, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because of making the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their behavior, anathema, terrible. But because of that commitment to their fathers, God is, go God is saying he is going to save them for that sake. So, in practice, they have created an enmity with the gospel. In reality, God will remember the covenant that he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, <laughs> that's important. Whatever God says will finally happen. It cannot be revoked. It cannot be it cannot be changed. So therefore, the promise he made to the to the Abraham, despite all the failures by the children of Abraham, he intends to revisit it. The same thing with you and me. He has said, those who come to him in repentance, I will know why it's cast away. So you can rest assured if you have if you are born again, he will give you the ability to withstand the devil's temptation. And one day you will be with him in heaven. If you can see yourself consistently enjoying sin, most likely you have not been, you have not been, you have not been selected for the kingdom. Because if you are selected for the kingdom, he comes into you and makes you desirous of walking with him, not walking with sin. But if if you if you are desirous of continuing in sin, hmm. A Christian can fall in sin, but a Christian cannot walk in sin. You know, falling is something that happens, and the devil is good at it. He can make you fall into sin. But as soon as you are fallen, the Spirit of God who is in you 
will convict you. You will be totally uncomfortable in sin until you repent and you're restored back to God. So that way, the covenant of God becomes irrevocable, cannot be changed. It will certainly happen. Whether that promise is the promise he has made to us who are Gentiles, is when we become Christians, or is a promise he made to the Jews through their patriarchs, it will be irrevocable. What an encouraging thing to know. That you can't wake up every morning feeling like God has left you. No. Once he commits himself to you, he will walk with you all the days of your lives. And when you start doing something wrong, he will, he will send his spirit to make you totally uncomfortable in sin. Again, let me repeat, if you enjoy sin, chances are you have never known him. He is not one with you. Because if he is one with you, he is saying the promise of God is revocable. There is no way you can start, you can continue in sin when he is the one who has chosen you to walk with him. And I think that's, um, that will be something important for us to think about. Look at, look at verse um, 29. For the gift and calling of God are irrevocable. For as, as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. In other words, one good example of God's promises is he had said the nations, the Gentiles will come in. And sure enough, they have come in. You are, you are one of the Gentiles that has actually come in. He is telling the people in Rome. You are one of the But do you remember the way you live your life? In disobedience, in witchcraft, just think about your forefathers and your traditional religions. Things that are certainly are, will bring you a curse. But despite all the evil in your history, God forgave you and made a commitment to walk with you for the rest of your life. So, Paul is saying in verse 30, for as you were once disobedient to God, which is true of you and me, but yet now, you have obtained God's mercy, even as they themselves are under and, and God's curse for being enemies of the gospel. My friend, even so, these also, the Jews, have now been disobedient, that though through the mercy shown by you, by, through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. In other words, you, you and me, were in sin. God rescued us. The Jews are still rejecting, rejecting Christ. But he is saying, because of his election, he is going to turn back to them. And despite all their disobedience, he is going to forgive them and change their direction. That's what he is saying in, in Romans 10, verse 31. How? Why? It's a mystery. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. That's really part of the mystery. God is again in sin. He has actually promised to punish sin. So why is he going to, these disobedient people, sinful people, these Jews, why is he going to turn to them despite their sin? Don't ask me. It's a mystery that God has chosen to, to, to have. And he doesn't explain himself. And that's, uh, that's something that we have to, to think about. You know, we, we lived in sin. He is telling us. We disobeyed. He is telling us. Yet he turned the tide round. So we were all taken in to the gospel. And now we are assured of that promise, irrevocable promise, to walk with us right to heaven. To heaven, to heaven. You know, it will be important that you understand that. That you are willing to accept God's call to be saved. And he is saying, because of that, don't be lukewarm. Don't be somebody who is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Be fully in it. And walk with the Lord. The other thing we are learning in the process is you can't be proud of your salvation. There's no, it's not an achievement we can congratulate you for. No, it's a mercy of God. You got saved by God's mercy. You deserved worse. But God gave you mercy. So if you know it happened to you, 
Why do you doubt it could happen to the Jews? He, because when God decides to show them his mercy, well, that's, that's, that's his choice. Every one of us will come to God through undeserved mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that will be something very, very important to understand. You know, God's promise to the Jews will happen. God's promise to the Gentiles will happen. And God's promise is irrevocable. He will keep with it to the very end. Look at verse 3. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are the judgment and his ways past finding out. We have just seen God promises to do what he tells Jews to do. And he does not explain himself as to why he has chosen to do that. That's a mystery. But that's how God deep God is. That we can't figure him out. We only know him as much as he has revealed himself. We don't know all about God. We know enough about him to be able to accept him as Lord and Savior and to walk, to walk with him. That's really what we need to be aware of. All the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. In other words, God is not of our level. He knows much more than we can ever know. We should therefore thank him for his knowledge which we don't have, for his wisdom, which you don't have. And the fact that despite our limited knowledge, he has chosen to forgive us. And so we come, we, we, we enjoy a righteous judgment, a fair judgment, because he loves us, and because of his mercy. So verse 34 is saying, for what has, was for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Like I've said before, God has a lot of vacancies to serve him, but none of them is about a counselor. And a God's advisor. You want to advise God. No, you should not do that to so and so. No, no don't do that for Nganga. No, he doesn't have such a vacancy. And that's what he's saying. God is so sovereign that he has no counselor. And nobody can figure out the mind of God. That's really what he is saying in verse 34. He does not rely on our device. He doesn't even rely on gossips. So that you fear what people are talking about you, creating stories about you, it will not affect God. God knows the truth, goes by the truth. It doesn't matter even if it's the pastor and the bishop who is creating a story. Of course, you'll be understood by other Christians and they will even ostracize you. But heaven will still be your home because God knows the truth. He does not have somebody advising him. There is no vacancy. Then in verse 35, he is saying, Oh, who has, who has first given to him and shall be repaid to him? In other words, is God poor? So that because of what you have given him, he has to think again. And that's what bribery is all about. You give somebody money which he doesn't deserve, so that when finally you go to him, he has no alternative than to go good to you because of the kind of money you bribed him with. So here Paul is saying, that's not God. He is a sovereign. There's nobody, nobody who is rich enough to be able to, to, be, to, to give God a favor. No, 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 no. Who has, he, who, who has first given to God? And what did you give him? Because anything you have, he gave you. So who is this? You are not a creator. Anything you get is from him. He is saying, if you had, God is capable of repaying you if there is a claim you could place on God. And that's um, something that is very interesting to think about. Who has first given to him? The answer is none. Everything you have belongs to him. So you can't start telling him, by the way, God, you have to be merciful to me. Why? I've done so much work for you. Question, where did you get the energy to do the work? 
Number two, who gave you the knowledge? Number three, who, who's, who, who made you uh, think about it? So, all but done by God. What does God owe you? Absolutely nothing. You can only claim his mercy, not to think that you actually deserve anything. Who has also given to him? Nobody. Then verse 36 says, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. In other words, I told you uh, this chapter 11 of Romans is about God's sovereignty. So we learn, since God does not require an advisor, he does not require anybody's wealth. So we can only summarize that the God we believe in, he is the one through whom and to whom all things are. In other words, nothing on earth could be there if it were not because of him. He is the creator. And it came Anything that comes to your hand, it's actually through him. He could stop it, but he allows it to come to your hand. That is who God is. And since he created it and it came to you through him, then you should give all the glory to him. And this glory will be there forever and ever. So he holds everything in his hand. He makes it come together. He holds it together. That's who God is. So do you understand then the mystery? The mystery of God that we might claim to know something but we know very, very little. So think about all the mysteries that the cults are involved in. Some will claim they understand it. Jesus is the one that is God. There's no God the Father, no God the Son. Mm. And they teach it. Then others will teach that the Father is God. Jesus is the one of the men. He's a creation. It was created by him. Unfortunately, the scriptures will not support them to be something extra-biblical, to not be something that God has said. And one could say the Holy Spirit is God. Who is you and he is God. But he is not God in the occlusion of the Father and the Son. And I think that's something you need to be aware of. So we have learned that let the mystery remain a mystery. Since he has given you enough information, rely on that to walk with him to heaven. Don't try to simplify what is not simple. Like this issue of the Jews and the Jews being forgiven although they have been rebellious and enemies of the gospel. How would God change his rules? If he does, remember he is God. He doesn't have to answer to anybody. Not at all. He can do it. He can change the rules for the Jews if he chooses to. We will get whatever God has said. Ever heard of the man who, who talked about uh, employing some people at 3 o'clock, others at 4 o'clock, others at 5 o'clock? Then when he was paying the salary, he paid all of them the same amount. And they were mad. The ones who came in early in the morning were mad. So he asked them, the money is mine. Did I give you what, what was required, what we agreed? And that's what you will tell the Jews. Did I do what I, I promised to do for you? Yes. If I choose my money or my mercy to do with something that you yourself will not do, anything wrong with that? It's my mercy. It's my money. And obviously you have to agree when something is not yours. You can't stop somebody doing what they want to do with it. Do you understand? No. Do you accept? Yes. Because if you believe he is God, then you must accept he knows what he is doing. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's not to figure everything out, but to accept things the way God has given them. And the good thing he has written in the Bible, so you don't think somebody is cheating, you can read for yourself and see the things that he has explained and the one he has left as mysteries. And Paul himself, as knowledgeable as he was, 
cause the mystery.